You know, you had this recent piece in Jacobin uh, uh, called McDonald's workers in Denmark won good pay and benefits through striking, which fits nicely with the segment that I did uh, a little earlier. Uh, can you explain just why the McDonald's jobs in Denmark are so good? Uh, and and do, does McDonald's even taste better in Denmark? How's their Big Mac? <laughs> they do sell beer in Denmark. so uh, That it explains is. it. <laughs> Um, yeah, so in 1981, McDonald's came to Denmark. Uh, it was the 20th country that they moved into um, after they started in the U.S., as we all know. Um, at that point, they had resisted unions every in every single country except for Sweden, which they had accepted on day one. And they came into Denmark and said, we're not going to deal with the unions. Um, and the way that wages and conditions are typically set in those countries is... Every few years, the unions for every sector come together and the employers for every sector come together and they hash out a deal. And it sets the wages, it sets the work rules, hours, breaks, all that stuff. And those agreements are not binding. They're not like collective bargaining agreements here where if someone breaks it, you go to arbitration or you go to a judge or something like that. They're uh, just kind of uh, guidelines that people voluntarily follow, you know, voluntarily in quotes, I guess you would say. And... McDonald's said it wasn't going to do that, and the Danish unions initially kind of <laughs> seemed a little bemused by it and, and tried to get them on board, tried to explain to them, you know, hey, like, this is something, you know, this is not really something you can choose not to follow. There were a lot of uh, newspaper articles, a little bit of boycotting here and there, just trying to get McDonald's waked up to the fact that, you know, they can't just not follow the uh, sector agreement. And uh, McDonald's kept on, and in 1988, the unions kind of got fed up. That was about seven years after McDonald's arrived, and they said, all right, well, we're just going to go ahead and call strikes everywhere. Um, not just at McDonald's, we're going to call strikes at every other business and sector that McDonald's interacts with. The dock workers went on strike, stopped unloading McDonald's containers. The construction workers went on strike and uh, stopped building McDonald's stores, including they, they just shut down a, a construction site of a McDonald's that was half-built. The truckers stopped delivering the food and the beer to the stores. The, uh, the uh, what do you go, the typesetters, the people who put ads in newspapers refused to run McDonald's ads in newspapers. I mean, it just went on and on down the line. 16 different unions uh, came together and just basically shut McDonald's down. And uh, one thing I didn't point out in my piece was that at, at one point, actually, the strike spread out into other countries. So Finland, um, they had some McDonald's there, and they had been unionized um, in the interim period. And, and they started striking and boycotting McDonald's in Finland as well. And so the pressure really came on. And McDonald's, just a few months after all this began, they, they gave up and, and started following the sector agreement, which was the hotel and restaurant workers agreement in Denmark. Hmm. I think that uh, something interesting you point out in your piece is that, uh, well, first of all, you know, as you said, lots of people don't know this backstory. We just kind of take it for granted that like, you know, like Danish McDonald's are great. Uh, you know, they, they make $22 an hour and they have like all of these great benefits. Um, so, you know, not only was this the product of strikes, but you point out in your piece that this actually... Um, this actually tells us something about the construction of the famed Nordic welfare state, right? Which I think a lot of people, like at the very worst end of the spectrum, just kind of attribute to like a uh, like happy or like generous Nordic culture, or like mm -hmm. you know something. They're all be white. Like, <laughs> Nando, <laughs> you went there. Yeah, some people say, well, like they're uh, you know racially or ethnically homogenous. That's why they're able to have this welfare state. Um, but but that's not the whole. That that's not the story. Um, what do these strikes actually tell us about the Nordic welfare state? Yeah, I mean, the, the real story of the Nordic societies are the labor unions. That's, that's, the, that's what runs everything else. Um, labor unions put together the welfare state. The labor unions set all these labor market conditions. The labor unions kind of, you know, ran the show in the middle of the century, uh, both in the state and outside the state. Um, these days, you know, maybe they're a little bit weaker than they were, you know, it's a, you know, neoliberalism has hit, has hit everyone. But even today, they still do stuff like this, you know, not infrequently. Um, so yeah, I mean, the labor union is, is at the core of at the core of all this. Uh, I included some other story, brief stories in the in the piece that I wrote, for example, um, in 2019, in Finland, there was a postal strike, and they just shut down all the airlines and ports and docks and all that kind of stuff, just, just to protect the pay of 700 workers. And that was a state-owned company. 
Um, and they got that done, and the prime minister actually resigned as a result of the strike. And then, and then the, probably the most telling story was, I think it was 2018, this was also in Finland, the conservatives had won the elections, they were going to make it easier for small employers to fire people. They had the votes to do it, they were ready to go, you know, there's no problem, like as far as parliamentary passage goes, and the unions just started going on strike uh, against the bill, not against an employer or a firing, but just against the legislation. And they end up pulling the legislation um, because the strikes, you know, so we're just we're just so damaging. And you know, what can you do up against rolling strike waves? So, I imagine that when the um, u- labor unions in the Nordic countries first came to be, that there there wasn't particularly favor- favorable conditions uh, for them, um, because I think there's a. I just wanted to ask because there's a lot, a lot of talk now here about the passage of the PRO Act uh, and you know labor organizing for the PRO Act to, to reform our uh, labor laws, which are which are quite restrictive compared to uh, places like the Nordic countries. But it seems like kind of a chicken and egg situation, which you you know you need the labor to pass the the laws, but you need the laws to get the labor. Uh, wh- what's the how do we get out of that? that kind of chicken and egg situation. Yeah, you know, I mean, I support the PRO Act, of course. I don't really know how to get out of the chicken and egg situation. I know there are a lot of people who claim to know (laughs) how to revitalize the labor movement. Um, You know, I I was going to be a happy soldier in that movement uh, when I graduated law school, and I I worked in it for a couple of years, but I don't really know how to get that going again. It's really, and like you said, I mean, when it got it's when it got started in in all the countries, it wasn't legal. Uh, you know, <laughs> the labor unions were never welcomed. Um, in Sweden, the workers weren't even allowed to vote when labor unions started going. Like the unions won the right to vote for workers there. So you know, if you enjoyed this video from Jacobin Weekends, please hit like and subscribe. That way, you'll enjoy all of our backlog, as well as all of our future content, including interviews, live streams, and clips. Thank you.